Gregoza. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Steve Gregoza. I'm the Special Assistant Public Defender for Mr. Selk. Uh, I think the, the clearest way for me to present this issue is for me to address the prejudice prong first and then backtrack to the error issue. Um, <clears throat> that the prejudice deals with, but for the error, there would be a reasonable probability that the verdict would be different or that there would be a different outcome. And I suggest there is, and here, here's why. When you look at the state's case, the, fir the biggest piece of evidence they had, on the one hand they have the, uh, the girl who testified against her grandfather. And basically her testimony was she's 17 years old and between eight to 12 years earlier, he had sexually abused her in various, various ways. There's really no specificity to what she's saying. There's enough, I think, to get past the jail away. That's why I didn't raise the issue with you, but, I, but she's really not specific as to dates, times, places. I mean, she touches on it, but you know, there's no, on this date, this time, here's what happened. I had a, I had a, a calendar, or I had a diary, and I write these things down. There's nothing like that. All right, so on the one hand, the state has a case of her testifying to what happened. On the other hand, we have Mr. Sell who's saying, I absolutely deny this happened. Absolutely, never. The police testified, he said it didn't happen. The state even put on his phone call um, to, his, to his wife where he denies anything happened. He's given explanations, I don't know what this girl was doing, there's all these crazy things with her mother. And again, so when you look at just those aspects, it's, that's really what this case comes down to without the alleged error. It's what did she say, what did he say, what evidence did he have? So, throw into this equation the fact that his wife says, and this is a defense witness, the wife says, I heard him admit that he did it. I suggest to the court that that's a complete game changer. Well, counsel, she also says she observed conduct by the victim that's inconsistent with what she said the grandfather did to her. No, she did not, Your Honor. She never said that. She said she saw the girl jumping on him, running all around him, but there was nothing ever. She, she testified she never saw any improper action between her grandfather and the daughter. Well, she saw suggestive conduct. No, I, don't, I disagree with that, 100% judge. Uh, <clears throat> her testimony was specific. I never saw any inappropriate actions between uh, Mr. my husband and this girl. As a matter of fact, the, when the, the defense attorneys wanted to put um, this woman's testimony on, they said it's a double-edged sword, and they're saying the benefit they're getting out of this was that she would testify that she, this girl had been jumping all over Mr. Selg, and somehow this gives the impression that uh, there was some type of sexual contact between them, which I, su I suggest just does not make sense. So I suggest that when you look at what the, the benefit that this woman had to testify, it's zero. The pot that for the state, it's 100%. I, I say that what completely changes the whole thing around. Now, there was a way too, the state could have, the, the defense could have said, well, we're gonna let her testify about um, the actions that we think are such a big deal here to show that this girl is making the story because she was jumping all around the, her grandfather. They still could have asked the judge for a motion limiting it. Look, this is more prejudice and probative. Look at what her, she's saying. She doesn't remember, uh, I'm talking about the confession. Or he said, I did it. Uh, she's saying she doesn't really remember, she has Alzheimer's, she has some issues, but they didn't even do that. They did nothing, absolutely zero. So I suggest that when, you, when the court considers now the error, was it an error for the state, for the defense to put her on as a witness? Does, how does his report, his, he has, there's a re recorded telephone call. <coughs> right. Well, how does that play into this? Well, you know, I don't know why the state played it. I think if that was basically help the defense. He's still denying anything that happened. He's, uh, Mr. Selga's trying to give an explanation. I don't know what this girl's talking about. So, I mean, to me, I, I just don't know why they played that. To me, that would have been something that the defense would have wanted on. But, of course, you know, it's self-serving hearsay. But in this respect, 
How can we know that I don't there wasn't we, some t tactical, you know, we don't, we, we don't know why the lawyer did what he did because we haven't had a discussion with him, with him which we normally would. But I think this, it, well, this was an 850. Uh, but I think you do know why they did it, Judge. They say specifically why they did this. They said, this is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, Judge, we think she can testify to this girl jumping out around her, around the grandfather all the time. We think that's a positive aspect of the testimony to show that because of this, she came, she came up with these sexual allegations. That's why they say it in a record. So they're explaining why they think his tes her t the, the, mother's, the grandmother's testimony is relevant. But, but once you admit that there is a double-edged sword, doesn't that show some strategic analysis? No, yeah, but it, look at their analysis. What, what exactly did it add to the defense? It added zero. But you, you also couple, as I, as I read it, the, Mr. Selg was very, very insistent that his wife be put on a stand. But, <clears throat> They still have to make a strategic analysis it's, that's not deficient. And if, there, if, if somebody's going to look at this and say, you know, the damage that she can cause is he's saying he did it, compared to her saying the daughter was always jumping all on her, or the granddaughter was always jumping around him. I mean, I, don't, I think that's, that's some, I suggest that's nonsense. Where is there a connection? How does that somehow translate that she's going to make up these sexual allegations against him because somehow this girl was jumping all about the, on, grand, on the grandfather? Uh, it's a non sequitur. It, it, that, I, I don't understand where they can come up with that. Did it, Mr. Selg fit through the proffer as to Ferrero's competency? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Did he fit through the proffer as to her competency? Mr. Sell? Yes. I believe, I, I, from the record, it appears to me he did, yes. And during that proffer, she also gave the same testimony mm. that you don't find suggestive or favorable right. to him in any way. Right, manner. I agree, I agree. I, he, and following that proffer, counsel, out of concern, requested the judge to specifically ask Mr. Selg if he still wanted to go forward. I agree, Mr. Selg said yes. So he knew the two-edged side of her testimony. I agree 100%. Having just sat through it. But it's not his call. It's not Mr. Selg's call. It's the lawyer's call. The lawyer is the one who has to decide what evidence goes before the jury. Okay, let's say that's fine. Let's go, let's say that's... It's debatable as to whether an inference could be drawn uh, it, from her testimony that the victim was acting inappropriate. Okay, I have two answers to that. First, I disagree that it's debatable that the victim's testimony, I mean, the, that Mrs. Selk's testimony Mrs. Ferreira's. Um, well, well, okay, the grandmother. Right. I, I suggest that it is not debatable that the grandmother's testimony that the daughter jumping all around her grandfather all these years as a little girl somehow translates to now this girl's making a false allegations of, of sex against him. I, I suggest it just does not make sense. Okay, Did the, the she other, also tell the daughter, or at least she testified that she told the daughter about the inappropriate comment? Or was it the grandfather that told the No, the, the grandfather said he had told her mother about what, the, uh, what, the, what, the, what this girl had been doing, coming down, pulling her pants down, that type of thing. That's, that's what, that was on the phone call. But then, Judge, okay, let's take the court's argument a, a step further. The court is saying, well, if it's debatable that what the grandmother had to, to say was going to help the defense, then why didn't the defense do a motion in limine to keep out the negative part. And say, so, you know, Judge, we want her to testify about that she's jumping all around the, on the grandfather because we think this somehow translates to her fabricating sexual innuendos against him or accusations against him, which, okay, let's say that's true. The state still could have, defense still could have said, you know, Judge, consider what this woman is saying about the confession or the, the, he, the admission he did, that he's saying he gave to the police. First, police say they didn't hear it. Second of all, she says she has Alzheimer's. 
Third, she says she really doesn't even remember. Fourth, she says she's not even sure what he said. And Judge, I want a ruling on on relevancy, prejudice uh, versus probative. They didn't even do that. On on their own witness? I'm sorry, Judge? You you want them to have a motion to limit the as I think, I think, I, I think, why not? They said, well, Judge, we, the, we're, all, we're putting her out for this specific purpose. If she's going to testify for this, we say she's not competent to testify, or her testimony is more prejudiced and probative on this, and here's why. And I think under those circumstances, Judge, when you're dealing with a woman who admits she has Alzheimer's, who admits she really doesn't remember, who admits she doesn't even really know, I mean, why would the court, why would you not even try that? Let me ask you, go back to something you said earlier. <clears throat> Because I'm candidly not certain I know what the law is on this. If, if Mr. Sells heard roughly what she's anticipated to say before she's on the stand. Judge, I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I'm, maybe sorry. I'm getting, getting old. I can't hear. Me too. Right. Um, <laughs> it, it, Mr. Sells is generally aware of what she's going to say before she says it in front of the jury. Right. And, and no one's suggesting that she's committing perjury or saying anything false. She's just an older lady with Alzheimer's. But if Mr. Selg, as the client says, I don't care what you're telling me, Mr. Gregoza. I really want my wife to testify, and even if you tell me that she shouldn't, I want her to testify. Don't you have to put her on? No. I, as a matter of fact, I've had such a, I, uh, cases like that, Judge, I've withdrawn. And I've told the client, here's what's going to happen. It's going to backfire around you. In the middle of trial, you withdrew? Well, in trial, I, no, I would have brought this issue way ahead of time. To the job, we'd have done it during trial. But I think when you have, when I think the client, the lawyer, first of all, whose responsibility is to call the witnesses? It's clearly the lawyers. That he's got, he, that's his responsibility. He can't say, well, my client wants me to pull it, so I'm going to do it, even though I know it's going to ruin the case. <laughs> that, that, that's not, that's the, it's the re- responsibility of the lawyer. And, and I think the lawyer has to make the decision. It's not going to work, and I'm not going to do it. And if you're going to want somebody else to do this, well, then I can't do it. So the only witness that a defense attorney is obligated to put on is the defendant himself if he wants to. I think, uh, well, and even then, I, the, the case law, that, and I've cited, that I've looked for the case law. There's a couple of cases, I think, I don't know if it was a third DCA or fourth DCA. Maybe we can get a opinion from the second DCA now. But it said that specifically, it's the lawyer's responsibility to call the witnesses. To the, the lawyer, the client can say, look, I want this, I want this, and certain things. But when it comes down to the trial reasoning and logic and putting out witnesses, it's the lawyer's fault. Consider this. If this woman did not testify, would that have been a game changer? And don't forget in this, this is where the jury wanted to hear back his testimony from the phone call. So they had to have some type of misgivings about something somewhere, something about what's going on here. You take her out of the equation, they, they have nothing. All they have is her word against his word, and her word is somewhat discombobulated. Okay, thank it you very much. It I'm wasn't sorry. good enough. I mean, the, the lawyer sought to get the judge's input on this, try to talk his client out of it. Yeah, but the I think. reading I get of this. But why didn't he? Well, I agree, Judge. He, he told the judge, here's the issue, but I think he should have taken it a step further. I think he. What, why didn't. The issue, Judge, is, is it really. Would it have been proper to say, Judge, I want a motion to limit to, to stop her from testifying about what she heard? Well, we don't even know if she really heard it, and she's even saying she's not even sure she heard it. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Bouchard. May it please the court, good morning. I'm Suzanne Bouchard, and I'm here representing the state of Florida. I would like for us to remember where we are procedurally in this case. We are on direct appeal, and this court and numerous other courts have held that generally ineffective assistance of counsel claims are not cognizable on direct appeal. There is a very, very, very narrow exception to that. The courts have said, in fact, this court in the Corzo case said, there might be rare exceptions to that rule when the ineffectiveness is obvious on the face of the appellate record. We don't have that here. The prejudice caused by the conduct is indisputable. That's certainly not the case in this situation. And a tactical explanation for the conduct is inconceivable. Now, I want to turn to Judge Altenburn's question. 
about the consent of the client. Apparently I'm not certain whether this is a little closer on this record as to whether how, how we answer the three questions you just, it, it, in part because they went through the proffer ahead of time and so everybody knows what this woman's about That's right. To say. That's right, Your Honor. Uh, I'd like to call the court's attention to the Ferguson case that was cited in the initial brief. Uh, that's out of the fourth DCA. And in that case, this was a 3850, and it, it was an appeal from a 3850. What happened there was that Ferguson complained in his 3850 that counsel was ineffective for failing to call a co-defendant as a witness. Now, um, apparently he had lost below, so he appealed. And the fourth DCA held whether to call a witness at trial is the type of strategic decision for which a lawyer's professional judgment is generally not subject to post-conviction second guessing. Critically, the court also said, and I quote, if the defendant consents to counsel strategy, there is no merit to a claim of ineffective assistance of counsel. So I would submit that that answers the court's question. Now, the other thing that I would like to, to emphasize here is that claims like this turn on issues of fact. And the Strickland standard really uh, illustrates why this is so, because you have those two prongs that, that the defendant must prove. He must prove both deficiency and prejudice. And because these things turn on issues of fact, and that means that both sides are entitled to present evidence to the trial court so that the trial court can make a decision. And that is why these claims are generally not cognizable on direct appeal. I would submit to you that this, the ineffectiveness is not apparent on the face of the record. We, do, we did have a proffer. We also had a situation where the defendant specifically agreed that he wanted this witness called. And I don't think that, that ineffectiveness is apparent or clear on the face of this record simply because this witness presented both unfavorable and some favorable testimony. Did, I would did, ask- Did she provide any unfavorable testimony on direct or only on cross? Only on cross. Her direct testimony had to do with uh, her observations of the interactions between the victim and Mr. Selg over the years, the fact that um, I guess they had, you know, had an ongoing family situation and that there was never any indication that there was anything between them or there was no, you know, hesitation by the child to interact with Mr. Selg. And it also sort of, his theory seemed to be that she was sexually active or sexually curious. She started having problems in her life. And then she decided when her parents called her on it, she decided, oh, I'm gonna you know, make up this story about how my granddad abused me when I was a little kid. So she did provide favorable testimony. Yes, indeed, she did. She was able to talk about uh, you know, their interactions over the years. On cross-examination, which the state had a right to do, they brought out uh, what she had said about what she heard. Now, Mr. Why was that within the scope of cross-examination? Well, there was no objection to it, and, you know. If there had been, would it have been sustained? I don't believe so. I, I think it would have been overruled. I think it would have, uh, I, I think it was. In, in direct, did she provide she, discussion, well, did she provide evidence of discussions between she and her husband? I don't, I don't really recall the specific answer to that. I, I, I don't know. I, I think that she, uh, she may have stated that she was there when he was arrested or, or something. I, I don't know the answer to that, Your Honor. I don't have a specific memory of that. Okay. But I would still submit that this is not an issue that is cognizable on this direct appeal. This is something that is appropriately brought in the trial court in a post-conviction motion where both sides can present their arguments and their evidence and that the court can decide it on the basis of the evidence because this is something that would require uh, testimony on the part of trial counsel as to why he decided that he was going to approach this this way. So I would submit that this court needs to affirm this and Mr. Sell can bring this in a 3850 and the trial court can take evidence and decide this on the basis of evidence and decide whether both prongs of the Strickland standard have been met here. I would ask the court to affirm. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I filed a notice of a supplemental authority in a case that this court came out with uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, just April 30th, Pierce v. State. Um, 
where Judge LaRose and Judge Alterman wrote the opinion, and it, it dealt with sim a very similar issue. And this deals with, uh, with the issue of, is the, re is the error apparent on the, on the face of the record? The Attorney General keeps saying it's not, and I keep saying it is. But here's what the court ruled on this. And this dealt with uh, 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 making a decision about impeaching a victim. The court said, counsel might have made a tactical decision in not introducing those prior and consistent statements. But the, such a decision is not apparent from the face of the record. Okay, a tactical decision. What difference do we have in this case? In this case, we have the lawyers specifically saying why they are put here on the record. They're telling the court the tactical decision that they made. And their tactical decision was be, that they believed that this the testimony of this, the grandmother saying that the girl jumping on the grandfather somehow translates to this girl fabricating sexual, sexual accusations against the father, I mean against the grandfather. And I suggest, Judge, that that tactical decision is ridiculous. To somehow say that the fact that she was jumping all over as a little girl over the grandfather, all as, as little girls do on grandfathers, somehow means that the girl would make up sexual accusations against the grandfather? That doesn't make sense. So I suggest that the tactical decision was error in itself. And putting around was error in itself. And didn't have to do any motion to the liberty was error itself. And all this is apparent from the record. If this goes back to the trial court for 3850 when they have a hearing, what more will this lawyer say? I think there were two lawyers, actually, because I had talked to them. But what more would they say? We have, the court has the reasoning. It's apparent on the record. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Gregoza, I'll just comment that the court appreciates that you often ask for oral argument and come and vigorously defend your clients. And, I'm sorry, and, I said, I just want to comment that the court appreciates the fact that you often ask for oral argument and come and vigorously defend your, your oh, clients you, here in, in open court. That's a, thank you. The court's going to take about a 10-minute break, and when we come back, we'll take up with Lee County versus Wyman.